What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind, peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. Such is a world worthy of our struggle and worthy of our children's future. Twenty-seven years after President Bush called for international order, the strongmen of Saudi Arabia and Russia celebrated the lack of it as America pulls back under Donald Trump. Friday marked that sharp split as the 41st president of the United States, George Herbert Walker Bush, died at the age of 94. This morning, we remember his life and his tremendous legacy and how his approach to leadership stands in stark contrast with the politics and the news and the policies of today. Welcome to Morning Joe. It's Monday, December 3rd. With us, we have the president of the Council on Foreign Relations and the author of the book, A World in Disarray, Richard Haas. Historian, author of The Soul of America and Rogers Professor of the Presidency at Vanderbilt University. John Meacham is with us. He's an NBC News and MSNBC contributor. NBC News chief foreign affairs correspondent and host of Andrea Mitchell Reports. Andrea Mitchell is here. And columnist and associate editor for The Washington Post, David Ignatius as well. Joe, um, wow, what a stark contrast between H.W.'s uh, legacy and the news we have today. Well, it is, and it, it, it did. It, it, it did seem to become starker uh, every time you saw uh, stories about George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush and the life that he lived. I will say that it's almost as if uh, Bush 41 inspired this president to uh, even move beyond his own boundaries that he showed the first two years by delivering to this country and the world a statement uh, upon. George H. W. Bush's passing, mm -hmm. that was graceful uh, and that was presidential, and uh, quite frankly, what's been lacking a bit in the past. But I want to talk to John Meacham, who on Wednesday will be uh, eulogizing uh, George H. W. Bush, and who spoke about him yesterday at the National Cathedral. Um, you know, John, we could talk about how great, what a great man George H. W. Bush was and how he guided America and the world through the ending of the Cold War, how he reunified Germany, how, uh, well, just, just, you know, a CIA director, a U.N. ambassador, ran the RNC, vice president, president, congressman, took courageous stands. He was a great man. Mm -hmm. But... What is so remarkable in 2016 and the great takeaway from his life has to be that he was a good man. He was fundamentally a decent man, uh, not only when he was president of the United States, but when he was a young child, uh, a, a kid yeah. whose nickname was Have Half, because every time he had a sandwich, whoever he was with, he'd tell the other person, here, have half of mine. Right. And it was that generous spirit that, again, made this great man a good man from the very beginning. Anyone who was around him was enveloped by a kind of quiet, persistent charisma. And it's not a word we associate with President Bush. Mm. Uh, we think of Jack Kennedy as charismatic. We think of Reagan as charismatic. We think of Clinton as charismatic. We think of uh, George W. Bush as a kind of lock with a locker room charisma, a kind of one-on-one uh, -on -one ability. Barack Obama has the big arena charisma. George H. W. Bush, to my in my experience and, and to my observation, always communicated ineffably a kind of ambient sense of confidence that your future, your country, would be safe in his hands. And they were big hands. Uh, he used to talk with that big left fist. And uh, I think that one of the remarkable things about him is he is of our time generationally, but he really has more in common with the Roosevelts and the founders, culturally and temperamentally, than he does with the post uh, in the 1990s forward. 
more in common, I think, with uh, FDR than with Bill Clinton, or even in many ways with, with his own son in terms of the politics they confronted. So he's a, he's a remarkable figure in that he was a little out of fashion even while he was reigning over the country. A couple of things happened on his watch uh, that shaped the politics we have now. The rise of talk radio, uh, cable news was becoming more significant. He used to uh, bellyache into his uh, tape recorder all the time about you know what the talking heads were saying. Uh, and most importantly, the break uh, among the House GOP against his deal to get a budget, get spending controls, a deal that set with some, with some higher taxes, set the conditions for the prosperity of the 1990s. In what was, I think, sort of the O.J. The Simpson bronco chase of modern partisanship, uh, when Bush was going out to announce that bipartisan deal in the Rose Garden, Newt Gingrich leaves the White House. There's a split screen on CNN, drives up to the Hill, and there's a rally among the House caucus, mm. GOP caucus, for Gingrich. And in many ways, that set the stage for 1994. It set the stage for uh, just a, a, more brutal, a more brutal politics. And it happened, interestingly, to my mind, under the feet of someone who did want very much to govern with consensus because consensus had shaped him. Yes. Uh, you, you know, David Ignatius, um, again, comparing where we were with George H.W. Bush and where we are now, um, I read so much this weekend, but I think a paragraph uh, in the president's own war words, former president's own words, really boils it down that, yes, every politician makes mistakes, every politician is flawed, every politician uh, will fight like hell to get their story out there and sometimes use very sharp elbows, but at the end of the day, um, it's, you know, they put their country first and they put uh, people around them first. This is uh, a, a part of a note that George H.W. Bush wrote to Maureen Dowd. He said, I reserve the right to whine, to not read, to use profanity, but if you ever get really hurt or if you ever get really down and just need a shoulder to cry on or just need a friend, give me a call. I will be there for you. I will not let you down. Now, if George H.W. Bush, who was skewered by the media uh, throughout most of his, his political life, had decided to call anybody an enemy of the people, it would have probably started with Maureen Dowd. But he understood that the press wasn't the enemy of the people and even said, basically, at the end of the day, we're all in this together and I will be here for you just like I know you would be here for me. What a remarkable difference between 1988 and 2018. Well, George H.W. Bush, uh, never more than in the recollections that Maureen has in that wonderful column, uh, was for a, a patrician son of the elite, uh, a down-to-earth guy. He was, he was funny, he was self-deprecating, he couldn't quite figure out why he liked this New York Times uh, columnist, but he, he, he did and he kept uh, writing to her. I, I think one of the things I liked most about him was that he was uh, graceful in the old-fashioned New England way. He, he didn't believe in showing off. Uh, the idea that you'd brag about your accomplishments would, would have been a, abhorrent to him. But he had an ability to make difficult things look easy uh, throughout his presidency, especially through in foreign policy. We forget how hard it was to find a pathway so you could reunify Germany. The, the, the cornerstone of the post-Cold War world was one Germany. Bush had to do that with, with great uh, subtlety. A friend of mine reminded me over the weekend, we had the SNL crisis on Bush's watch. And guess what? A lot of people went to jail. He didn't make a big fanfare of it, but he held people accountable. It's the one thing that never happened after the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. You want to look at a reason Trump got elected. It's all these people. Said, why, why wouldn't anybody be punished? Well, they were in, in George H.W. Bush's presidency. So I think those simple qualities that, 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 that you know, made him somebody that Marine Dowd could tell funny stories about, I mean, it, 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 that's what we all sense about him. That's what we love and we miss as we think about his passing. 
Richard Haas, you worked for uh, President Bush, uh, Bush 41, uh, and uh, obviously during very momentous times, uh, so momentous that you didn't even have time to cut your hair Look or even him. comb it at times. My goodness. Uh, he, he's, he was a very busy scraggly. man. Scraggly. Very busy, scraggly man about town. Uh, You're so cute. Sort of, that was, he called that his Neo Einstein cut. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, Richard, um, I, I'm just curious, looking at, at pictures of uh, this past weekend, Vladimir Putin uh, high-fiving uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia uh, when other world leaders didn't want to be even seen shaking his hand. Um, it just reminds me of how deaf, what a deft touch George H.W. Bush had, that he was a realist, but at the same time uh, would never allow something like that to, to stand without calling it out. What, what, what are we missing uh, with, uh, with the leadership of Donald Trump? No, George H.W. Bush was a realist, but he was a realist who also had values and standards and principles. And he, he always tried to balance it. One of the first tests of his presidency, you'll remember, in 1989 was the, the crushing of dissent in Tiananmen Square. And what Bush tried to do, because he had been the former U.S. envoy to China, he knew how important that relationship was. And he couldn't allow the, the relationship to, to end. At the, on the other hand, he also knew it was important to send a message. And sanctions were, were put into place, and the administration tried to, to, to balance that. Or when Saddam invaded Kuwait, one of the reasons Bush uh, felt urgency there is he was getting the reports of what was going on in Kuwait and he, he essentially said we've got we've got to act here or if we don't there's not going to be a Kuwait left to left to save and he didn't have the the patience shall we say of some people who said well just let sanctions work and he said no we'll give them a fair chance but then if we must we will use we will use force and then what was so interesting is after we used force in a decisive way to liberate Kuwait he also then had a sense of restraint and he said, look, we, we had a mission here, which was to liberate Kuwait, but not to liberate Baghdad. And if we try to do that, we will go against what we promised people, and we will incur more casualties there than we did in, in liberating Kuwait in, in, the, in the first place. So there always is a sense of balance in the man between a kind of a principle uh, and a real determination. I think people underestimated uh, the, the steeliness of the uh, determination. But he also had a sense, again, of limits, of restraints, whether it was in his personal relations with people. Uh, there was a formality. I remember once I, I was called over to see him, Joe, and I got to the door of the Oval Office, and John Sununu was the, the chief of staff at the time, and he said, what do you think you're doing, Richard? And I said, well, I just got a message that the president wanted to see me. And he said, uh, go back to your office and put on your coat. Because I walked over with just my shirt and tie and left my suit jacket in the office. And there was a sense, Bush more than anyone else, and it is a contrast to today, obviously, he had a sense, Joe, that he was the temporary custodian of the Oval Office. He didn't own it. He was simply the 41st president of the United States. He knew there'd be a 42nd, a 43rd, and so on. So he was very aware he had been given this trust. He, uh, he was a borrower, if you will, of the uh, office, but ultimately he knew there were limits and he had to pass it on to who came after him. And, and you brought up Kuwait. It's so interesting. I remember being a young congressman and uh, my chief of staff coming in and saying, do you have time to talk to the, the, the president? And since I was a backbencher, a president sat and called me and I said, the president of what? <laughs> and uh, said, the president of the United States, the former president, George H.W. Bush. And I said, well, yeah. And I scrambled around. I picked up the phone. And it's, it's important for people to remember now. He was getting absolutely skewered in the years following the first Gulf War for ignoring the advice of the red-hot conservatives and some of his generals and stopping short of Baghdad. Mm. He was getting killed, and I was the one person on a panel that was defending him, saying, no, he showed extraordinary discipline. He said we were going to liberate Kuwait, and then we were going to come home. And even with an open road to Baghdad, he knew that's what he had promised. Mm -hmm. That's how he had built this remarkable worldwide coalition. And, uh, and he showed the discipline that few other leaders would show. And because of it, he didn't get ensnarled in the war that his son got ensnarled in 
uh, several years later. But, you know, Mika, it was that sort of discipline that actually yeah. made your father a very big fan yes. of George H.W. Bush. And I would say you could count the number of Republicans that your father voted for on one hand. Um, yeah. You actually could count the number of Republicans your father voted for for president on one finger. And that one president was George H.W. Bush. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube. And make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.